Um, just a little background on Charlie before. Um, so Charlie, um, Charlie is the director for Common, responsible for sourcing uh, new project opportunities, securing partnerships. I apologize. Um, interfacing with planning departments and all other real estate activities in the markets of Boston, Denver, Pittsburgh, and Texas. Uh, he previously spent the bulk of his career working on the principal investment and development side of the business for various private equity funds, including Atlas Capital Group in New York from 2014 to 2019 and Beagle Capital Partners in Boston from 2010 to 2012. Charlie, thanks so much for joining us um, and we look forward to your presentation. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Zoya and Logan and uh, to John Pugh, who I don't think is on yet, but uh, thank you guys so much for hosting me here tonight. It's uh, a pleasure to be here speaking uh, with you all this evening. Um, I originally uh, grew up in Boston area. I grew up in Newton, Mass, but uh, I'm currently based down in New York City in my role working at uh, Common. And uh, as Zoya said, yeah, I've been, uh, you know, been with Common for the past year. I'm a director of real estate uh, on our, our team here, um, working on expanding our portfolio and, and partnerships nationally, um, specifically in the Boston area, Denver, Texas, and Pittsburgh. So um, I'm going to share my screen and go through... Uh, you know, a quick uh, sort of, you know, number of slides for about 20 minutes or so, just giving you an intro to the common, the company, um, what co-living means and looks like for us, and then sort of, you know, go into a little bit about our belief in the resiliency of, you know, cities and, and co-living as a product type to help housing affordability and attainability um, going forward, um, you know, following the, the economic impacts of the public health crisis. We're currently, uh, you know, still still in the midst of. So um, give me one second here to share my screen and I'll jump into it. Can everyone uh, can see that? Look at that. Yep, great. Yeah. Um, so Common is a residential brand and operator. We are, um, you know, at our core, we're a, multi-family property manager. We, we manage uh, apartment communities um, nationally. Um, we design, we manage them, um, and we were founded in 2015 uh, by Brad Hargraves, who formerly founded a company called General Assembly down at New York City, which is a you know, 21st century trade school um, teaching sort of tech and software coding things of that nature. Um, we're a venture-backed company. And we're uh, headquartered in New York City. Um, we partner with developers and owners, um, and uh, you know, we have sort of you know, these are sort of six main ways we increase value for our partners. Um, you know, we're we're delivering a higher NOI, net, net operating income, um, leading to sort of faster lease ups and higher occupancy. Um, offering some product differentiation through our, our co living unit types. Um, Generally, very focused on community-driven design, bringing people together in our, our communities and buildings. Um, we are, you know, really focused on creating a strong consumer brand nationally in the multifamily space, which has not existed on a broad scale before um, across multiple markets. And everything we do is sort of threaded through um, with technology-enhanced operations. Um, at our core, you know, we're, we're really trying to address the you know, broken housing market, um, which is, you know, sort of, as I, I'm sure everyone knows here, you know, especially locally in the Boston market, I mean, rents have risen dramatically, especially in the past decade, but, you know, they've been rising across the country uh, drastically um, over the past 60, 70 years, um, while incomes have remained relatively flat. So that sort of has resulted in, you know, the younger generations, the renting generation uh, sort of population today having to dedicate a higher proportion of their income for their housing costs. Um, we have a, you know, sort of, uh, you know, Common is our brand which operates, um, 
city living for young professionals, um, through co-living, traditional, you know, conventional unit types, studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, um, micro units. And we do this through buildings that are both 100% shared suite co-living designed and hybrid designs that have a portion of, of traditional units, some co-living, some micros. Um, we recently launched uh, about a year ago in partnership with Tishman Spire, a brand called Kin, which is catering to young families uh, staying in urban areas, wanting to sort of rent and providing services and communal spaces for them to uh, make that more um, just uh, accessible for them and supportive for that uh, demographic. And uh, in the past three or six months, we've launched a workforce housing brand called NOAA, uh, which we'll get into a little bit uh, down the road. Just to give you a, a quick snapshot of our portfolio and, and operations today, we have about uh, just under 50 properties open um, and a little under 3,000 uh, residents or bedrooms that we operate in across eight uh, cities or metro areas. Um, we've operated that at a, a pretty high occupancy across our portfolio. Um, it's taken a little bit of a dip recently with you know, some of the economic uncertainty around uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but, you know, we increasingly, you know, we, we started exclusively in the co-living space, uh, designing uh, shared suite co-living um, and operating it, you know, exclusively. But over the past two or three years, we've really um, migrated to doing more and more traditional unit types as well. Um, this is really, you know, it's a, it's a demand driven phenomenon. Um, we have, you know, our portfolio today, as I said, is, is just under 3,000 beds across these 50 buildings. Um, we have a terrific sort of marketing and leasing engine, which today um, generates about, you know, in excess of 20,000 unique leads per month of individuals who want to live in a common branded building. Um, but we only have about 40 to 60 vacancies which come up month over month. So we're really focused over the next, um, you know, 12, 18, 24 months uh, on increasing the supply of our units, getting more existing buildings under, under control, under operation management, as well as working on ground up developments, which by their nature will deliver, you know, two, three years down the road. Um, this is just a, a snapshot over time of uh, the, you know, how we've scaled up. Um, back in 2015, our first property was uh, called Common Pacific uh, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, was a, you know, brown, three, four-story brownstone that only comprised of uh, 19 bedrooms. Um, but over time, we've really scaled up the size of our assets. Um, you know, we just took over last week a, a large scale um, building in South Florida in Fort Lauderdale called uh, The Edge, which is about 330 units, fully traditional uh, building. So we're excited to be open in South Florida and diversifying you know our locations and, and product types so we currently have a development pipeline of in excess of 15,600 beds um, across the country in uh, about 22 cities uh, in the US Dublin and Canada this is just a quick snapshot of some of those locations um, including uh, where we're open today the, the bulk of our properties um, the most properties we have are in New York Chicago and LA but we have uh, several buildings open in Seattle San Francisco slash Oakland as well as uh, Fort Lauderdale as I just mentioned DC and Philadelphia um, so gonna give a quick rundown I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard uh, the term co-living before um, but gonna give just a quick overview of what what that is and what that means for us at Common. Um, Co-living is, is really for us a, a housing format specifically designed for roommate living. Um, roommate living is not a new phenomenon. Uh, it's been happening for you know, uh, hundreds of years. Uh, I'm sure many of you, if uh, you know, either in college or you know, first apartments, uh, living in cities, early in career, uh, had a roommate in order to save, save on your house costs, save on your rent, so if you have two bedroom, three bedroom, or larger unit. Um, we're really just trying to make that process more convenient, seamless, and streamlined. Um, 
Whereas, you know, historically, you know, at least the past 20 years, the, the, the easiest way to find a roommate, if you have friends who are moving at the same time as you in the same city or, you know, uh, located proximate to you um, was to go on Craigslist and, and sort of respond to an ad and a random person. So we were really just taking larger units. Um, our sort of sweet spot is three to six bedroom uh, suites and, you know, essentially renting it out by the bedroom. Everyone has a private bedroom. Um, there's a shared common space within a unit, um, you know, in terms of a kitchen and living room. And uh, sometimes they're, you know, on suite bathrooms, other times they're shared bathrooms between two folks. So there's just... And the, you know, the real value out of this is that we're, you know, able to derive uh, per revenues for our partners, for dollars. Um, if, you know, in this example, you traditionally had, you know, two market rate, you know, one bedroom apartments, um, you know, you're, you're maybe getting you know, around 350 per foot in rent um, by designing it and operating it leased out as a four bedroom suite, um, you're able to generate a, a higher revenue per foot of around $5. So that's essentially you know, the, the real thesis behind why this makes sense for developers and, and the economics of it. Um, you know, we're able to increase rents and NOI for our partners. Um, there are some increased uh, operating expenses associated with, with operating that type of density. Um, we do, oh. Um, um, Charlie, I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt. Um, I think your voice has been breaking. Is there any way for oh, you no to problem. check your- Maybe interview? I'll go to my headphones here. Okay, great, thank you. About that everyone. Can, you, can you hear me better now? Um, if you can make it just slightly louder, but much clearer. Thank okay. you. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, just getting back into it. Um, you know, the the real value add we're able to offer to our partners and to, to buildings and projects we work on is through higher rents. Um, we are able to increase revenue and operating income by designing and operating buildings. Uh, as co-living. Um, we do offer additional services uh, beyond what you would get in a traditional apartment. These units typically come fully furnished. Um, they include utilities, they include uh, Wi-Fi, they include weekly cleaning of the common areas, as well as restocking of shared goods. Um, so we're really trying to make it a single chunk per rent that we're charging the consumer and provide a high level of service and convenience um, in that unit. The value proposition for the tenant or the consumer is really um, you know, sharing uh, you know, savings on their total housing costs. Um, typically, you know, we are pricing our bedrooms at a discount to a market rate alternative studio or one bedroom. Um, so, you know, your base rent, you're saving maybe around 15% uh, for that bedroom. But when you factor in all those other uh, services we provide that I mentioned previously, the total housing cost savings is, uh, you know, in excess of 30%. Are, are can you guess that for me uh, a little bit? All right, I'm, I'm just pulling up the chat here now. Zoya, is it, is it better? Not really. It's still okay. quality. I, I'm, I think it might be the internet, but I uh, guess we can't fix that. Okay, sorry about that. I'll, uh, I'll do my best here. No, that's okay. If someone suggested if you can turn off your camera, if you stop your video, it might strengthen the connection a little bit. Gotcha, give me one sec. Sorry, everyone. Bear with us. Any, uh, any better there? Sounds a bit better. Okay, sorry about that. I'll uh, keep chugging away here. Um, so this is just a, a snapshot of our typical renter. Um, you know, we, you know, co-living has sort of um, proliferated for a number of reasons. So today's, you know, generation, 
um, you know, in their 20s and 30s are, are marrying later, they're living in cities longer, is highly educated, but, um, you know, is sort of riddled with various forms of debt, either student debt or otherwise, and, you know, that's delaying their ability to buy a home, um, as, you know, which is also intertwined with, with the other uh, factors above. But, you know, our, our typical, you know, median, um, member or tenant is 30 years old, you know, making somewhere between, you know, sort of 40 and, and $100,000 a year. Obviously, it differs based on market pretty significantly. Um, a, a huge percentage of our, a large percentage of our tenants have, are just moving to the city for the first time. Um, but they, you know, they're, they have strong credit and, and are able to sort of afford this type of uh, unit. So this is just back to what I was sort of explaining over the the previous, um, you know, couple of couple of minutes. You know, there this is sort of a win win both on the development side, able to increase you know NOI, diversify the product offerings within the building, um, and, and sort of activating our really strong tech enabled leasing and marketing platform. Um, and renters, you know, the the proposition for the consumer, the renter is having a lower rent. Um, in a, a really great located city um, or area within a city and sort of the community benefits we provide as well. This is uh, another illustration just to give a better sense of what our shared suites look like. Um, you know, you can see that everyone has sort of their, their private bedroom um, and, you know, there's sort of a, a shared living room uh, within the suite as, as well as dining and kitchen that that everyone is uh, has access to, as well as you know, throughout the building, there's additional community or many spaces that you would expect in in most other uh, multifamily apartment buildings as well. So uh, you know, there, obviously we're we're in the midst of uh, you know a, a pretty serious public health crisis here for the last three or four months. It's been uh, kind of a wild ride in, in the real estate world and. Um, it was very interesting listening in to Jonathan Burke's talk a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, it's been great to see Boston and, and other cities increasing the, you know, um, availability of, you know, alfresco dining, sort of activating streetscapes for pedestrians and not sort of being dominated by, by the car. Um, I think, you know, this, um, the COVID crisis is obviously going to have some serious impacts for real estate and, and the way we live generally. Um, and it's raised some, some questions and, and I think some anxieties about co-living and, and shared spaces during, you know, how do you social distance or quarantine in a co-living unit? Are people going to be afraid to live in this way going forward um, coming out of, of COVID? Hopefully, you know, this is a, short to medium term crisis. And with any luck, I think we'll have a, um, you know, a vaccine within, you know, a, a year, 18 months is the hope that everyone's holding out for. Um, so we're not, you know, we, we are believers in cities and in urban living generally. Um, and I'm just going to go through a couple thoughts on on how we're approaching it. So you know, I think the, the biggest uh, takeaway for us, um, you know, is really that co-living provides, um, you know, an affordability versus market rate apartments. Um, you know, sometimes we refer to it as housing attainability. We're, we're still a market rate product, but trying to give people greater access to live in, in the areas they want to, you know, to, to be in and be close to their work without having to commute uh, long, long distances. Um, you know, we think of co-living as somewhat counter cyclical. Um, you know, once I, I think, obviously we're in the midst of, of the public health crisis today, but you know, I think the more lasting impact of this era is gonna be the financial pain that sort of has persisted uh, or, you know, it has caused. I mean, there's 40 million Americans on unemployment today. Um, you know, it's going to be, there's a lot of hope or, or talk about a, a V-shaped recovery. I think it's unclear how quickly, you know, employment's going to come back, but I think it's going to have lasting impacts on how people think about their housing costs uh, going forward. So, um, you know, we really think that this is, this is the key um, to why co-living is going to be important going forward. Um, 
as people, you know, look to save money on their discretionary expenses or, or non-discretionary, in this case, their housing costs, you know, it can save them, you know, 30% month over month um, to live in a, in a comparable location to, to where they want to be. Um, secondly, um, our in-suite services model. Um, and we've, you know, we've obviously adapted a lot of our policies and procedures during uh, COVID as well, I think, as all apartment operators have had to, um, you know, in terms of uh, staff wearing, wearing PPE, you know, shutting down amenity spaces temporarily to, to stop, you know, congregations of large amounts of people. But we believe that the, the weekly cleaning we provide um, in the suites has is, is been really important. Um, we, we've sort of upped the cleaning generally in our properties to, to make sure people are staying safe and, and keeping things clean. Um, I think I saw a question in the chat earlier um, about what, what those uh, shared goods are. We replenish weekly. It's, you know, it's really the basics. It's things like soap, paper towels, toilet paper, and that just, you know, we, we've stepped up the replenishment of that, the amount of uh, supplies we're providing in the suites, things like, you know, so to avoid having people to go out as much um, and expose themselves um, the last couple months. The other thing I think, you know, we, we really believe that uh, the social connection that, you know, co-living uh, provides it has been really important. We've seen our tenants respond really positively to living in co-living throughout, you know, the time of uh, stay-at-home orders and, and, and quarantines. Um, you know, we're still working on pulling together the sort of data around this, but, you know, just as an anecdotal uh, sort of way to think about it, I think, you know, we, you know, personally, I've sort of, you know, I, I live in New York City typically, but while it's been so crazy there, I, I moved out to Long Island, I'm out in Long Island with my in-laws and, and family. So it's been nice to have more people instead of being stuck uh, alone in my apartment with my wife and I. And I think our, our tenant base, our consumer has appreciated having those limited social actions with a small group um, within their suites, um, as opposed to, you know, being totally isolated within a, a, a one bedroom or studio apartment and, and not really seeing anyone or interacting with anyone in person for months at a time. Additionally, um, I haven't really touched a ton on this, but but community is really an important part of our product type um, across our portfolio, definitely in the co-living suites generally, but you know, we generally host uh, a lot of different events within the buildings, um, you know, things like happy hours on, on the roof deck or lounges or amenity spaces, but also events within the cities and, and proximate to the buildings as well. Um, and I think, you know, we, we've been able to cultivate that uh, to a degree uh, through virtual events, you know, wine tastings, fitness classes, building wide, you know, hangouts in, in lieu of those in-person events. Um, and I think that's, you know, provided a, a really great way to um, support our, our tenants during this sort of challenging time for everyone. Um, our technology is another way in which, you know, we're very well positioned, I think, to adapt to the new realities. Um, you know, historically, we've built up a, a really strong virtual touring platform uh, where we sort of have these 3D tours that you can essentially walk through an apartment um, on your own, um, you know, or, or guided by one of our leasing specialists. Um, you know, and we signed about 30% of our leases with uh, tenants not even stepping foot in a building. Um, over the past three months, we've, we've gone exclusively to virtual touring. So we've really, you know, while we had built up that muscle and had policies and procedures around it, we've had to sort of strengthen and, and rely on it to even a greater degree where we've been doing 100% of our, our leasing and touring through uh, virtual tours. Um, and lastly, you know, a, a big part of our model relies on a centralized staffing and service model. Um, you know, while we do have our typical, you know, maintenance techs or, or leasing specialists on site in the buildings to, you know, handle the physical uh, necessities of operating a, a property, um, we support them through, you know, other staff 
you know, who's not on site, who's, you know, in our office in New York or other satellite offices um, to sort of streamline and, and drive efficiencies um, across the portfolio. So I think, you know, just in conclusion, and I'm sure people have some other questions related to this, but, you know, we, we are strong believers that, you know, the current public health crisis is not going to reverse, you know, the urbanization trends of the past 50 years. Um, you know, I think we've definitely seen a lot of people, you know, fleeing cities for the short term or, you know, um, with the adoption of remote work and, and fear about being in close proximity to other people in those dense urban environments. But, I think at the end of the day, you know, people are going to continue to desire to live in these dense urban environments. Um, you know, and co-living is a great tool to, to help accomplish that goal and providing this affordability and attainability. Um, you know, humans are, are naturally social animals, um, you know, want to be close to other people, um, interacting socially in restaurants, bars, cultural institutions. Um, and while there is, you know, a, a greater uh, acceptance of remote and virtual work. And I'm sure you've all been on a, a lot of Zoom calls and uh, panels like this in the past couple of months. I think, you know, naturally cities are going to remain economic engines uh, of, of our economy and, and it's going to, you know, come back very strong. Um, just to give you a snapshot of, of what we're up to in the Boston area these days, um, we, uh, we have one deal that's been publicly announced that we're working on uh, in Austin, Mass, uh, called Common Albright. Uh, it is a 100% co-living building. It's a six-story tower of a, about 135,000 square feet, um, comprised of 200, just under 280 bedrooms. Um, it has just under 60 four-bedroom co-living suites, a couple of smaller ones that are three bedrooms, and uh, a handful of studio units as well. So. We're working on this with um, Arcs Urban um, and Boylston Properties, who are a couple of local developers, and very excited as they uh, move through the final layers of their approval processes this summer and hoping to break ground towards the end of uh, 2020. This is uh, just a quick glance at, at a few of our other projects uh, in our pipeline. Um, you know, uh, we're working on a big project in Miami called Common Grove with uh, the Terra Group, a guy named David Martin, um, uh, that's, you know, about 528 beds. It's a, it's a large scale tower uh, with, you know, a small portion is co-living, but Common will be operating and managing the entire building. Um, Common Roosevelt uh, down in New York City, up in Harlem, is in partnership with L&M Development Partners through a uh, pilot program developed by the city of New York to incorporate co-living into their affordable housing goals. Um, so we're very excited about that one um, and a couple others here as well that you can take a look at, but I'm going to keep uh, moving on. Um, we, you know, this is just a snapshot of some of the partners and lenders we're currently working with, um, you know, as I mentioned, L&M Depart Development Partners, Tishman Spire, Heinz, Dream, uh, some of the largest, you know, institutional developers out there. Um, and, you know, working with, you know, agency lenders from Fannie and Freddie, as well as, uh, you know, Deutsche and Citi. Um, and sort of touched on this briefly, but, you know, Common Roosevelt, uh, we're more and more layering into, you know, utilizing co-living as a part of the uh, solution to affordable housing. Um, across cities. Um, so that's something we're really excited about and probably don't have enough time to get into the details here, but um, these are a couple of our projects. One in Atlanta, Common at Englewood, um, Common Roosevelt, which I mentioned with L&M down in Harlem in New York City, and then Common Two Saints down in uh, New Orleans. Um, I mentioned uh, NOAA, which is our workforce housing brand. Uh, we launched in the past six months. We took over about six assets in uh, suburban Virginia um, with a group called Outlier Capital. Um, and really the, you know, the thesis here is that we're trying to make, you know, workforce housing better. Um, historically, it has been sort of a decentralized, you know, regional players operating these, uh, you know, class B and C, you know, older assets that cater to more of a workforce uh, demographic. 
Um, but we're really trying to bring, you know, a, a data-driven approach to, to capital projects, um, a, a differentiated consumer brand, um, you know, and, and improve the, the customer experience in that, in that type of housing. And, and also mentioned Kin, which is uh, sort of a brand catering to uh, families. Um, we have, you know, different types of amenities offered in buildings, you know, things like nanny shares, shared play places, um, other, you know, events and community uh, things that are, are supporting young parents. Um, usually this is more, you know, families that have children b before school age, you know, sort of zero to five. Um, but we're, we're excited that we've opened uh, our first couple of properties for kin over the past uh, six months. So that's, uh, that's sort of all I had uh, off the bat, but definitely very excited to, uh, to be here with y'all and hope that was helpful to uh, give a quick run through of some of our, um, you know, outlook on, on co-living and its resilience going forward in the wake of, of COVID and the associated economic um, pain out there. And uh, happy to jump into some of the questions that have been coming in so far. I'll, I'll look back towards the top, but um, feel free to, to put any other questions in as well. Um, thanks so much, Charlie. This was fantastic. And um, just such a wide breadth of um, information. So I feel like on each um, bucket of, uh, you might actually be able to turn your camera back on just because you've okay. done a presentation. <laughs> yeah, I'll, get, I'll get back in here. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I feel like we could just kind of discuss each bucket of um, commons projects and we can have a full discussion. But um, in the interest of time, um, I had a few questions, but I think just because um, our guests have so many questions, um, I could just scroll up and start reading and um, you could start discussing with them, if that's okay. Yeah, totally. Um, um, so, um, and in case um, any of the questions you just answered through your presentation, free free to let me know and I'll just move on to the next one. Okay. Um, so the first one was from Heather. Um, Heather, if you want to like raise your hand or chat. It says, um, does the vacancy rate indicate low turnover? What range of annual turnover do you have? What's the median length of stay for your tenants? Has this been discussed? I just want to make sure. Yeah, no, I don't think we touched on that quite yet. So, um, you know, I would say our vacancy or sort of our turnover, our churn rate is pretty comparable to traditional multifamily, we, we don't see it being all that different from uh, the wider marketplace. One thing we've seen that's pretty interesting, we operate, you know, a, 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 num a lot of uh, micro apartments, you know, smaller studios that are sub 400 square feet in the Seattle area and, and in other places across the country too. But we've actually seen that co-living has, has had a higher retention, a higher, um, you know, lower turnover than those micro units. I think what we've seen is that when people make a, a close friend or connection, you know, really value that community feel that we were producing in the building, they're more likely to renew and stay. So we definitely track, you know, things like when they attend an event, um, you know, how much they're, they're interacting with other people, um, you know, in, in the building. So, um, you know, that, that turnover sort of, has a wide range by the market, by project. So it's hard to give a specific um, number, but I, I will say, I think just, you know, reiterating it's similar to, you know, um, to the wider multifamily um, asset class, you know, something around percent um, across all of is sort of the average we see. Uh, sorry, your voice broke there. Would you mind just saying that the last part again? Yeah, well, no problem. Um, I was just, I guess the point was, um, you know, the, the turnover we see is, is pretty comparable to multifamily generally, um, and is around, you know, the churn rate or turnover rate we see is about 50% um, on average across our portfolio. Um, and then if I just may add um, a portion, a, a tack on a question to that, one of your last, couple of your last slides showed that um, this year and this quarter has been the highest um, new leases that got signed and others just kind of curious um compared to last year has there been some marked change in the asks of the new leases just because the climate has been so different 
in the past? Have, have you seen some, just like what's example, happening? Like it increase in concessions or, or things of that nature? Or just a general ask of um, hygiene or just any? Specific? Yeah, I think there's been, um, you know, increased focus in those leasing discussions, you know, with our, with our inside sales team, with our leasing specialists. I mean, it's, you know, at the forefront of everybody's, you know, day-to-day -day lives and, you know, from everything when they go to the grocery store or, you know, if people are um, back on public transportation, they want to know that, you know, things are being properly maintained and clean. So, you know, I would say the safety and, and cleanliness of our properties is sort of really at the forefront of our concerns. And um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's inherently a, a new question that everyone's dealing with and we're very focused on. Um, the last part of Heather's question, I think, was the median length of stay. Um, so one of the things we, we do, and I think we're seeing this more across multifamily generally, is that, you know, today's tenant, today's renter wants more flexibility in their lease terms. Um, you know, while we strive to have, you know, a majority of our tenants on, on 12 month leases, we're certainly not a short term stay operator. Um, we do offer some flexibility in our lease terms. So we do, you know, terms as short as, you know, six or three months. Um, sort of the average stay, I think, it, across our portfolio today um, is about uh, eight or nine months, uh, or, or sorry, that's the average lease term, but uh, the average stay is closer to 10, um, 10 or 11 with, with renewals. Um, so, you know, similar, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, great. Um, so, um, again, kind of pandemic related questions. Um, how are the current residents coping with stay at home just since the uh, units that were designed pre pandemic and the, the really small footprint, the 307 square feet, how, how's that working out? And also yeah, the we... situation, um, I, I know that a lot of, um, co-working, people aren't comfortable sitting next to or moving in when you're not quite sure, you know. I realize that living, it's, it's more long-term, but. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's a, a, a constant, um, you know, question we get asked. Um, you know, our, we, we have an in-house design team. So we have a, a group of about 20, 25 architects, interior designers. Um, and we've sort of been iterating on, on the design side, you know, what these shared suites look like for the past three or four years and learning a lot through these different feedback loops we've gotten, you know, we get as granular on things as like how much storage space uh, each individual will need, you know, in the, in the refrigerator, in the kitchen cabinets, um, you know, so I think, um, you know, I think generally our residents have been coping pretty well with these stay at home orders and, it's certainly tough, I think, across, you know, city living that, you know, when you're building that you signed up for um, and wanted access to the gym and, and the roof deck and the community lounge, when those things are closed, it's inherently, you know, presents some challenges. And, and when you, you are stuck in your apartment so much of the day, um, it's, you know, th there's more friction or pain points between roommates, right? Everybody's there every day, all the time. It's not like you're going to work and, you know, seeing people at night. Um, but generally, you know, I think we really are, are glad that we've always been sort of uh, had private bedrooms. So, you know, I think some, some other models, some other operators have multiple beds in a single room. I think that doesn't work great. Having those different layers of private space, you know, you're sort of shared communal space within your suite of, of three to six people. And then, you know, the, the most uh, communal areas are the, the amenity spaces that everybody has access to. So it's, you know, I think it's been similar uh, uh, that we've all been experiencing, right? It's, it's not fun to be stuck at home all the time and, you know, not able to go out and experience uh, the local, you know, restaurants and, and uh, great amenities, you know, in the cities around our buildings, but generally, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, I don't think we've seen people terminating or, or leaving coliting in mass based on having to be stuck at home with three or four other people. It's actually been sort of a positive experience having that social interaction, 
sharing the cooking, um, you know, talking somebody face to face, not just video calls all day. Um, that's great. Uh, before I move on reading the next question, is there anyone who would just like to ask their question out live? Anyone want to like to speak up? You could just unmute your screen. Um, Logan, do you see anyone? If not, I can go on reading. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so the next question was, uh, with virtual tours, uh, do you share information on who your other roommates might be? Uh, for example, um, male, male, female, or all females, or female, female, male. Do you eventually meet your roommates prior to signing up? Um, so we do not, uh, we're not in the business of roommate matching. Um, you know, it's, it's a really challenging game. Some, some people try and do that uh, more, but A, you get into some uh, Fair Housing Act issues, um, you know, by revealing the roommates or, or, you know, the other people in the building, um, you know, that's uh, obviously illegal to, to sort of disclose who those people are and, and you know, opens you up for some liability, but uh, separately, you know, it, it would be not beneficial for the economics of the buildings and the occupancy of our buildings. You know, if you were waiting around to fill a bedroom until you found, you know, whatever that level of compatibility is between people, you know, you're, you could potentially have a room that's remaining vacant for longer than you would want. So um, it's really a first come first serve basis. Um, we sort of solve this question or issue on the front end where, you know, in our co-living suites or, or rooms, you, you do have the ability to transfer out if, um, you know, you are having a difficult uh, interpersonal situation with those roommates. Um, after the first 30 days, you can transfer to a new room, either within the building or a separate building, um, it, you know, within the city or across the country. Um, so that's sort of how we address it and get people comfortable up front. Um, you know, uh, we, we also don't, um, you know, I think there is, uh, we do take into account some of the preferences to be, you know, in an all-male suite or all-female suite. We can sort of accommodate that, but it's not that easy to find the right situation. So um, if, if the potential tenant feels very strongly they need that set up, they might not have a room available for them uh, for some time. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Zoya had to jump off, but I'll ask one more question and then we'll wrap it up here. Um, Bill asked, has the COVID crisis caused co-living solution providers to begin collaborating in new ways or sharing best practices relative to containing infections? Are competitors or funding sources concerned about WeWork's decision to abandon their co-living initiatives? Um, so, I guess a couple things to unpack there unpack there um you know we we live uh you know i think was never they had two buildings that they were working on one was in new york city and the other was in seattle um from our perspective they never really got off the ground that much it wasn't really their core business line um and i think well while there's been some recent headlines that you know this pandemic and, and the failed ipo of last fall has led to them abandoning their their efforts on the co-living front. I think that in reality, it, it happened much earlier than that as they focused on their sort of core business line of you know shared office space. Um, so I wouldn't say that's impacted our ability to raise capital or you know the market's perception of co-living generally. Um, to the the first part of the question, which I think was around you know sharing best practices, um, you know. I don't believe we've collaborated too much with, with other operators in the space. Um, you know, we have, you know, taken a very proactive approach to cleaning, doing everything we can, um, you know, internally to, to best handle the crisis. We, you know, have not had any, um, you know, uh, outbreaks, you know, in our buildings or, or, or real problems with, you know, COVID infections. Um, so we haven't had to like, respond to it in that way um but you know it's it's been more preventative measures along the way just to to make sure everyone is staying as safe as possible and and uh, comfortable in their units while they're sort of stuck at home 
Um, okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining. Charlie, that was really awesome of you to be here. Um, we have a CNU social hour after this. If anyone wants to jump on and continue the conversation, I'm going to drop the link here in the chat. Um, and I'd love to see you all there. I also dropped some links to the upcoming talks. So if you want to sign up for those, um, that would be great. And thank you everyone so much for coming. We'll share Charlie's information and we'll share this recording on the email list. So thank you everyone. And I hope everyone has a good night. Thanks so much, Logan. Great to uh, see everyone and thanks for having me.